Hello, my name is Bradford Ben, and for the next 20 minutes, I'll just be going over the high impedance system design ideas, hopefully answering a few questions along the way. Uh, I thank you for taking the time to review this, and hopefully you'll find it informative. Uh, s the first thing you need to know in designing a high impedance system is the speaker power ratings, and this is also known as distributed or 70 volt system. Uh, the reason you need to know the power ratings is so that way you know how much power the speakers are capable of handling and how much power you actually need to supply them. Uh, so the continuous power is the specified power that you can give to the speaker continuously without any breaks and just let it run for days. Some people also call this the RMS power rating but that's actually a little incorrect and a little outside the scope of this presentation but if you want to know more there are tons of resources to find that out. Uh, program power is what typically happens when you play music through it. So it's not a test signal, it's actually real music that has peaks and valleys and different dynamic ranges in it. So you can use this as the guideline for the amplifier power needs. And then there's peak power, which is an instantaneous spike. And the big question that often happens with peak power is how long is an instantaneous spike? Is it 5 seconds? Is it 5 milliseconds? So there is no industry standard, but it is a value you'll see quite often. So when you're matching the amplifier to the speaker, there are a few things you need to know. The amplifier power level should be higher than the loudspeaker. The main reason for this is the fact that you want to allow some headroom so that the amplifier doesn't clip. And by clip I mean start presenting square waves at the output. It actually clips off the top of the signal. And the way you define how much room you have left between the maximum level that the speaker can take and the maximum power that the amplifier can present is known as headroom. And we recommend at least 3 dB of headroom, and this allows for peaks to go through relatively safely. There are a couple rules of thumb for amplifier size. Uh, first, you have to decide if full power is needed, and we'll take a look at an example uh, of that in a few minutes. Uh, also, you typically you want to do something that's twice the continuous power rating of the speaker, and this will provide you 3 dB of headroom. And obviously there are sometimes some cost constraints with the system, so you might want to look at, at other solutions, such as multiplying your doubling of the power, so if it's 0 0.8 times the rating, it's 2 dB of headroom. 1.25 the, the rating is 4 dB of headroom, and this gives you more room for peaks to go through your system. Now power is not the only part of the specification you want to look at. Typically speakers will, in addition to having the continuous power and peak power, they'll also have a sensitivity rating, which is how loud the speaker plays when you apply one watt of power and you're one meter away. And this is a way of comparing them as they all use the same standard as well as the nominal impedance. And what impedance can be simply described as is its frequency specific resistance. What this means is there'll be different amount of resistance presented to the amplifier system at different frequencies. And you can see here in this graph that range can vary quite a bit. So the nominal impedance is oftentimes taken as 1.2 times the lowest point. So this is just an important value to look at and realize that it will vary. This also means that you can't just use a standard multimeter to measure the resistance or measure the impedance. Now let's actually look at how these systems work. If you hook up speakers in series or any resist resistive load in series, the total impedance presented to the amplifier or to the source device is the sum of the individual, because so it has to go through the first device and then through the second device before returning back to the source. If you hook it up in parallel, the total impedance is divided by the entire number of devices and the total number of devices. So there's the formula, the total impedance presented is the inverse sum of the inverse individual impedances, which I'm sure might not make sense, so let me give a few examples. If I have an 8 ohm speaker, I just have one of them, it presents an 8 ohm load. If I hook up a second 8 ohm speaker, it presents a 4 ohm load. If I have a third, it presents a 2.6 ohm load. 4 gives me 
a 2 ohm load. 5 gives me a 1.6 ohm load. And 6 gives me a 1.3. Now obviously I'm doing this all with 8 ohm speakers. This formula works as you divide into different ranges. So if you had 4 ohm and 8 ohm speakers mixed together, you can get different values in there. Now why this starts to become important, especially as we look at high impedance values, is this can greatly tax an amplifier. If you look at those same speakers and their different uh, ratings, and say each one you had 100 watts of power, as you can see, at 4 ohms and 8 ohms, paralleling that many speakers together can get to be a very low impedance, which means a lot of current and voltage has to come out of that amplifier to provide that 800 watts. And we'll talk about ways to counteract this. Because there must be a better way. And there is. It's a distributed system, also known as 25 volt systems, 70 volt systems, 100 volt systems, constant voltage, high impedance system, or paging systems. And the differences are slight, such as a 25 volt system should be hooked up to a 25 volt source amplifier. A 100 volt system should be hooked up to a 100 volt source amplifier. And this is the output voltage, not the current you get or the voltage you get out of the wall, but the actual voltage at the output. And this is, will be on the, on the specification sheet. This isn't new technology. It's a solution that has been around since the 1920s when they started distributing electricity for longer distances. What they found is that you can change the current and voltage as long as the ratio stays the same based on the rules of ohms and power law. What this means is as the current changes and the voltage changes, as long as the wattage stays the same, you can still distribute it easily. So if I need to distribute 100 watts, that's the same as distributing 10 volts at 10 amps, or 20 volts at 5 amps, or 50 volts at 2 amps, or 2 volts at 50 amps. As long as it multiplies out to 100, I'm going to get the same amount of power out, but it's the amount of work that can be done. What happens is, is that by putting it on higher voltage lines, you get less loss on the cable as it goes across. So the way this typically works in an electrical system, and most people have seen this, is you have high voltage power lines coming out of the generator. Those go to a local transformer station, which then gets distributed down to the house. And sometimes there will even be transformers along the way to step it down to the proper voltage for the house. So how does this apply to audio? What you can do is you can step up the output and decrease the current at the amplifier. And this can either be done by placing a transformer at the amplifier, such as with the Comtech uh, Drive Core series, which has the XFMR8 and the XFMR4. Or it can be done directly in the amplifier, such as with the CDI series or the CTS series of amplifiers from Crown. This allows you to use a higher voltage to drive a smaller gauge of wire for a longer distance, because you have less loss due to distance. But it does require that you put a transformer at the speaker to step it back down to the, pro to the proper level. The transformer also provides a higher impedance back to the amplifier, so you can parallel more speakers together. So if you need to power a thousand speakers, that can be done. Now I don't recommend putting a thousand speakers on one channel of amplification, but if you need to do it, you can do it, and there have been projects that work that way. So let's actually take a look at how this works. This needs one watt, one speaker needs 20 watts. If I do a 70.7 .7 volt system, which is the standard in the United States, at 20 watts on that speaker tap, that gives me a 245 ohm load to the amplifier. If I put two speakers on there, it goes down to 122. The fact that I put 3 on brings it down to 82. And if I go to 4, it goes all the way down to 61. Now, if you notice, I still need 80 watts of power, but the voltage has changed. And as you can see, it's evenly distributed. The way I like to liken this to is putting, various, is putting in four 20-watt light bulbs. You would get 80 watts of electricity out and 80 watts of illumination, for lack of a better phrase, because it would be paralleled across all of them. Now what I always tell people is what happens if you don't need that much power? Can you use less power? Yes you can and there are a few ways to do this. 
But let me explain to you how you would do this. Why should you do this mathematically? Uh, first, let's talk about loudness levels. Loudness is described as SPL or dB SPL, and it's the sound pressure level. And as you can see on this chart, it ranges quite a bit. And one decibel is considered the threshold of human hearing, which is the smallest change that you can hear. So a one decibel change in level is barely perceptible. Most people don't actually start to hear it until 3 dB of change, and it really becomes obvious at 10 dB, where most people will hear, will say that it's doubly as loud. Now what's interesting is this is a logarithmic scale, and we'll talk about the formulas in a couple minutes, but the logarithmic scale also works on the way that people hear. So that what happens is, is that at various powers, either 3 or 6 dB is double the power or double the, the output. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So paging levels, you typically want to be 10 dB above the ambient. So if you're designing something for a nightclub where it says that the typical sound is going to be 100 dB, you want to be 10 dB louder than that, so 110 dB. If you're designing for something where there's just background conversation, or conversational speech such as a store, 60 dB is the noise floor perhaps, so you might want to go to 70. You might want to give yourself a little more for more people and go up to 80. And you can see here are a couple different various levels that you can kind of pick as your uh, examples. The more you're above ambient, the better it is because most people will have an easier time actually hearing the page signal. So you heard me earlier indicate that a decibel is a ratio of two numbers. It's a way of expressing either the ratio between two values, so that it's how far away something is or how much power you've applied to something. So if I can mathematically determine how much power does the system need. I can determine what I want the listener at the level, what I want the listener's level to be. I can take that and determine it based on the speaker sensitivity, which comes from the cut sheet, on the amount of amplifier gain, which is 10 times the log of the wattage, minus the loss due to inverse square law, which is 20 times the log of the distance in meters, because remember earlier I said that uh, speakers are typically rated at 1 watt, 1 meter, so I want to stay in meters, and then I want to subtract the loss due to wire length which you can look up or use, but oftentimes this is such a small amount, it's not really important in a lot of systems. So let me explain the inverse square law. If you think of sound pressure, or sound as a balloon and a sphere expanding, if I double the size of how wide it is by basically doubling the distance, if you notice that balloon is double the diameter of the, of the first balloon. But if you look at that little highlight area, on the left-hand balloon, you can see what size it is. If I bring it over to the right-hand balloon, you can see their relative scale. That's because that same area is four times larger, because it's increased in multiple axes. So this is why every time you double the distance, you lose 6 dB of energy. So this is just part of the equation. In wattage, every time I double the wattage, I gain 3 dB. So if I look at those two formulas together, you can see how it starts to become a balancing act. Every time I double the distance, I lose 4 dB. Every time I double the wattage, I gain 3 dB. So if I'm um, 4 meters away, I lose 12 dB of level. If I want to get it back up to the same 12 dB, I need 16 watts of power. And you can do this math all the way through. And this doesn't matter if you're measuring in feet or yards or meters, as long as you keep your units the same. Now you heard me mention loss due to wire length. And these are just some standard rules of thumb you can use of various American wire gauges. At 14 gauge, a 250 foot run, you're going to lose 0.22 dB. Probably not audible. If I go to a 20 gauge wire and 250 feet, you're going to lose 0.82 may be audible. Now if you notice, go all the way to a thousand feet on that 20 gauge, I lose 2.62. I lose almost half my power just by that cable. So you want to keep cable lengths in mind. 
but if you keep the cable lengths under 250 feet, which most projects are, you can typically look at this as this is what headroom is for, and most amplifiers can deal with it. Now, I showed you the mathematical formula to do this, but there are various tools that will help with this, such as the JBL Ceiling Speaker Configurator. And what this does is ask you a few questions, such as what will the system be used for, how loud do you need it to play, what the type of environment is going to be, so that way you don't have to describe it in numbers, it will give you some good rules of thumb. And it'll come back with the recommended based on the ceiling height that you've told them and how far away it's going to be. If you notice, it'll give you various speaker selections. If you notice, it'll give you various taps. And none of these are that large based if you have a lot of speakers. So if I put 16 of them in, I only need a 2.5 watt tap. If I only put 8 in, I need a 25 watt tap. But if you notice, the distance between speakers can change a bunch. Now this gives you some good rule of thumb, but then you also have the distributed, and this will actually give you a final report. But after this, you typically want to use the distributed system design tool, also a free tool from JBL. And this is the same process, except now you plug in what the speaker model is. And if you notice, you can decide if you want a square or a hexagonal array. And the difference between these is basically what the pattern is and there is some cost difference and this will run you all the way through the entire system so you can kind of see what's going on but as you answer the questions it'll come back and tell you what the layout would be how many speakers you're going to need what they need to be tapped at and I haven't started talking about taps yet but I will in a second but what this does is you can generate the final report and if you notice it can give you the details how many speakers do I need What's the spacing between them? How even is the sound? What's the variation, as you can see? But the other big one it gives you is the recommended amplifier power. So if you notice, I need 105 watts of power. That's in recommendation. And this will let me hit a maximum continuous average SPL of 96 with pink noise and 92 with music. Pretty loud. So I know I need 105 based on the number of speakers and the fact that they're going to be tapped at 2.5 watts. So now if I, let's actually put this into play. So here's a system overview. And what I did is I went through and I designed the system using this design tool and I broke each rectangular area up and ran it through the system. Now one of the things I decided is that different zones needed to be different levels. So the bar is one level, the lobby is a different level, the restroom is a different level, and the, each one has different ceiling heights. Now the way you adjust this is by adjusting the taps on each speaker, which changes where it comes off of the transformer. This is just like deciding if you're putting on a 15 watt light bulb, a 30 watt light bulb, a 60 watt light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, same idea. It pulls off the amount of power it needs, it doesn't pull off all the power. So this is a way of being able to adjust that. So if I go through and I design the system using those tools, you can see I've come up with a total of various zones. Now you could say, oh, okay, they're all going together, I need a 180 watt amplifier. Round up a little bit, or if I want 3 dB of headroom, I need a 350 watt amplifier. That's one way of doing it, but there are multiple ways to do this. I can break it up into eight zones, and using a CT8150, which is 8 by 150 watts, with the XFMR8, which is the transformer pack on it, I can, I can divide this up and give each area its own independent zone. This means each one has its own paging, its own level control, its own volume. All simply and easily. Now that's one option. This might be, and as you can see, I can just come out of the CD player, go to a 28M, which is our mixer, go into the, into the amplifier, distribute out of the amplifier to the XFMR8, and then out to all, this, all the different zones. I could just as easily decide I have some slighter, tightly budget constraints, so I'm going to go through and I can go with a 4150, which gives me four zones. And if you notice, I've pared down the zones a little bit. 
And as if you notice here, I have the zone put together. So I have the exterior and the bar together. The lobby goes with the bar as well. I have the seating areas together. And then I have the offices. So if you notice, you can start putting things together. Less flexibility, less discrete zones, but I'm also saving a little bit of money. And I even can go down just to two zones using uh, MA1160 from Crown, which is a mixer amp that's 160 watts per channel. And if I just go down to these two zones, if you notice, simply wire out of a CD player or DMX music source, and I can come in and I can put my, my zones together simply and easily. All just by deciding how the system works best. So I've gone through and kind of shown the overall system. There are a couple things you need to know to be able to design your system. How loud does it need to be? How far away are the listeners? And think about it at ear height, not by how tall the listeners are. I typically do an ear height of four feet. So if there's a 10 foot ceiling, it's six feet to the listeners. How many different zones and channels of amplification you need? And then I pull out the tools that are available such as the JBL Ceiling Speaker Configurator and Distributed System Designer, which are downloadable. You can see the URL there. You can do a Google search. And then there are also crown design tools that will help you figure out the loss due to distance, as you saw I had up there, which is also available on the web. So hopefully this has helped a lot, and hopefully you've gathered some information. High impedance systems are nothing to be scared of. It's just like designing any other system, it's just the fact that now you can put more speakers onto the same amplifier system. Appreciate your time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to tech support or to your local distributor.